Welcome to the first ever threat management team office hours. Our agenda is full of a couple of really excellent items provided to us by our friend Philippe, and we're going to jump right in. <laughs> Philippe, would you like to verbalize your first topic? Absolutely. So there are not actually questions. It's more that I wanted to share with you some details. Yeah. So I'm working lately with the AppSec team on um, integrating more vulnerabilities in the dashboard, meaning we want to have the dashboard as a single source of truth for everything that comes to vulnerability management, which is extremely good news. We're all dark footing as much as we can. The only problem is we can't um, import or integrate vulnerabilities outside of what the analyzers are reporting. So we started to develop a fake analyzer that would import some vulnerabilities directly into the, into the dashboard. It's kind of working. We're hitting a lot of words in that process. And the last one was this morning. So I wanted to make sure that you had that in mind because that was absolutely not of use for me. And I've been there for almost three years. So that's a bit disturbing, you know? Um, so this, we have this, yes, go on. So this is the process that you and I have been talking about on our one-on-ones where you're kind of faking, the, not faking the results, but you're uh, forcing these results to show up in the dashboard by creating the JSON results that look like our normal scanners, but they just get taken in. We, I know in our roadmap, we've got the issue around creating, manually creating a vulnerability. Based on my conversations for you, I'm not sure if that meets the need though, because it's one issue at a time. Yeah, so that, that's the first point. It's, it's not great because it's really hard to do bulk imports with that. And the second point that is not going to work for us is the, the approval process. There is absolutely no control on who can create vulnerabilities and there is no review, there is nothing like this. The problem is if you start creating a vulnerability with this UI and there is no edit, and I, I would like to remind you that there is no edit in sight for now. So if you do any mistake in that process, then it's, it's there in the dashboard sitting there. We can't really remove vulnerabilities because there's nothing in the UI, nothing in the API for that. You can't edit, you can't update this vulnerability again. So we don't have the ability to have a second pair of eye, maybe by sharing the screen, but that seems very inefficient. So we came up with this idea of having vulnerabilities as YAML files directly where we define what we want. Uh, there are two, let me make my, bigger maybe uh two fields that are going to disappear this week this category is going to be removed because it's completely redundant with the category of the report and the cv as well it's uh, apparently deprecated but not that much actually if you don't have a unique string in this field uh if you dismiss one of the vulnerabilities right. all the vulnerabilities with the same cve are going to be dismissed as, uh, dismissed as well. I, so I, and I, I, wish, I wish we had someone on the back end team here too. And I know you've been having some conversations recently, Philippe, around this. I believe that is getting addressed yeah. with some of the ongoing fingerprinting work and having that not just based on that CVE or that identifier anymore. Exactly. But as of today, that's, that's the case. So I okay. need to change that and I want to generate something for the users instead. Um, so, hey, great. Good to see you. Uh, where was I? Um, <laughs> Dang it, Greg. You just threw off the train of thought. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fully. Go get back on the train. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so this so, is, this is where we are. And with that, we, um, we have a complete process where we can completely go through all the layers of of a workflow, meaning if I want to add a new vulnerability, I need to add a new file in this repo. I can't merge that into master without the approval of someone else in the team. So that means I have always a second pair of eyes and I have someone else pressing the merge button. So the, the process is auditable, it's trackable, it's approvable, it's everything able that you, you can imagine. So that's that's a bit more adapted to our, to our needs in the at least in the AppSec team. And the result is obviously that in the dashboard, you have the vulnerabilities imported like any other vulnerability generated by any other analyzer. It's just that the analyzer is uh, ASK. ASK is the, the AppSec Swiss Army knife. Uh, that's a tool that we're going to improve with time to be able to change the severities, to 
update the report in the way we want. So that, that's going to do a lot of different things. And there are- So how, I'm sorry, how much development work would help with this bulk import process that you've been spearheading for AppSec? You know, the, the, you're saying that uh, there's problems with it that you're working through. Where can Threat Insights help you? Uh, the problem that I have today, so there, there is just, let me share one bug that I just discovered before this meeting, you know, I'm the, I know. the, the chief bug officer in this, uh, <laughs> CBO. In this company, <laughs> the CBO. Um, that's funny. See here in this pipeline, I don't have any vulnerability reported. That's actually because they are dismissed and mm -hmm. that's the bug that we were talking about. I have dismissed this one um last week at 5 uh, 39 and if you take a look at this one which is different i haven't done anything it's also dismissed exactly at the same time because they share the same CV. cve right so they are dismissed here in the pipeline but actually it's exactly the same vulnerabilities as here but they are not dismissed in the dashboard well, that's kind of confusing to me okay I don't have me, but feedback I... on that, and I'm a little bit confused by that as well. So once something gets promoted from a finding to a vulnerability, they should still have the same underlying record that should keep them in sync, correct? And that's generally my my whole feeling about this. It, working with these vulnerabilities is it's not easy, definitely not easy, because you have to understand where they are persisted and when they are not. Can you go back the to the other screen? Sorry. Sure. So that's the pipeline. If you have this new addition that was added in the last version of GitLab, mm -hmm. where you can see the, the pipeline that generated this dashboard. And I guess my question is, is there a chance that this pipeline is viewing these dismissed vulnerabilities as different records than those that were promoted to standalone vulnerabilities? And I mean, we just need someone to troubleshoot this, it sounds like. So this it's could be a, a... Yeah. It, it has to be that. It has right. to be that. They have to be different records. Otherwise, I don't see why they would be dismissed here and, and, not, and not in the dashboard. You see, that's the kind it's of limitation kind of, that could be very confusing for someone that is just start getting started with GitLab. It's kind of the opposite of what you're describing for though, where things are tied together by one identifier. So you make a change to one thing and it impacts this other thing over here. These should have the same identifier. So they don't have that relationship that you're expecting. So they must not. Do yeah. you have a, have you create, and I know you we ask you this all the time and I appreciate that you do create such good issues for us. Have you created a bug for anyone to dig into? On Not this yet, I'm sorry. I've, I've been in meetings back to back until, <laughs> until this one, but after this one, I don't have anything. So we create I would volunteer to help out, but you're going to put such better information in it than I could. So, you know, I, I, I think this is one that we need to triage and actually look at the data records. I get a little bit lost in what's getting impacted by the improvements that the backend team is making for fingerprinting and what's not? I, I need to catch up on this. They are, I know they are doing things, but I don't know where they stand exactly. So one action that I am going to take out of what you just said, Philippe, is to follow up with the, the need for the bulk import and the edit and make sure that we have issues created that we can collaborate on and I can work with Matt if we don't. I'll make sure that we do have them somewhere and you haven't seen them that I mentioned you. Quick question about the edit though. Do you see that it would be okay or appropriate to allow people to edit most of the details? Or is there a point, you know, I could see where maybe you let someone edit something as a finding, but once it's graduated to standalone vulnerability, there are certain things that are not editable. That's, that's a great question, actually, because I, as I said, the problem that we have with the current implementation is the lack of control that we have on everything. Like anyone in this project, this demo slash import project with at least a developer um, membership would be able to interact with his vulnerabilities. And we absolutely don't want that in the AppSec team. So that means for us, if anyone goes to the GitLab dashboard and decide to start dismissing things, we absolutely won't notice a thing. We were, we're going to be completely blind. So we're trying to avoid all the interactions that would not be in the pipeline. So uh, that would not be part of the, the classic workflow with, I'm changing something, I need someone to review, I need someone to approve, and then it's 
merged or at least it's committed somewhere. So for us, the best, and I know that's not exactly the direction that you're taking, but the best would be to have the ability to change that directly from the file. So not having an ability to edit the, the vulnerabilities directly from the UI, but if I change something here and I decide that it's not the right CV here, it's not one, two, three, four, it's one, two, three, five instead, then it would update the dashboard because there's no way I can update the dashboard if this is not running in master. And the only you way to run you that want to be able to, sorry, you want to, you said you want to be able to up this, update this file without having to rerun the pipeline and have it update in the dashboard. That would be great. Because I guess if I do that, th the only way to update the dashboard is to run the pipeline on master. The only way to run the pipeline on master is to have everything approved and merged at this point. So if I change something in here, I can't push that to master directly because I need someone else to approve this change. So we are in this process of, reviewing, approving, committing again. And we need to go through all these layers to be compliant. And we're absolutely not compliant as of today. Because again, if you just, if it's a point and click and I can just edit the file and, or, or just click on the vulnerability uh, in, the, in the dashboard. Right, which that and, seems to me more clear of a path. You know, once something's been promoted to a standalone vulnerability, uh, the scan result that created that you know i don't i don't think that there's an expectation that that's even still on this on the system right i mean we've we've then put that into a database record and it's like separated from that yeah it's fine if it's in the database record as soon as i can interact with this database somehow and that's the way that right. we're using we're using these files to do that it could be something else but see for example if i click on the vulnerability and i'm i'm a developer in this project if i can change the severity here uh from something critical to something low or maybe even unknown that could go really under the radar and we would have no idea in the appsec team that's that is i'm sorry for the strong wording but that's unacceptable for us you see what i mean with that i understand because we can't guarantee that we've been through all the issues that were absolutely necessary. We, there could be someone in the process interfering with that. And we've seen that in the past. We've seen that people even outside of engineering were just demoing the dashboard, the GitLab dashboard, and they were randomly clicking on issues and dismissing them. We have no idea. And there's no track. I, I created- There's no history. Yeah, okay. there is an issue. I did track uh, security track. There is an issue. I can put with that. I, I, I think I've seen that one. So that seems like a, a that's a reactive step, though, right? So what you're saying is that you want to be able to stop those cases from happening in the first place. Exactly. Right now, there is nothing we can do, but at least we can improve a bit the process of everything that we we import. And. Great, by the way, if you have any questions or any comments on area or anything, I don't want to hijack the world meeting, so feel free to interrupt me. If you don't interrupt me, I'm going to talk for... I really do appreciate the questions, Philippe. No, they're great. <laughs> and I just pinged Matt saying he's coming to all of the rest of these office hours because this feedback is very, you know... Oh, he's, he's well aware of this. I'm sharing that almost every week with Matt. Well, then maybe you guys can have other time to talk about other things during your one-on-ones then. I have some other topics with Matt, don't worry. I, I've <laughs> more than enough to talk with Matt. Um, so any, any questions or any comments on, on this before I move on to the next point? I think I've asked all mine. Wayne, do you have any? Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. I, I know that a, a lot of this feels like you're having to repeat yourself, Philippe. Um, you know, a lot of your observations span various problems that we're aware of, and it's hard to make sure that we're not missing new areas that we need to make sure that we're putting attention to by glossing over some of the like, well, hey, that's just fingerprinting. We know that's a problem. Uh, <laughs> so I just want to make sure that, you know, any other areas that we're not currently putting attention to or tracking are getting highlighted. And just to, to make sure, so you're aware of that, that's, uh, to, to wrap up on this topic, 
um, so we are using the common library to generate the reports, which is apparently atrocious if you listen to the, the security team. I have no idea why, but I understand this morning because the, I thought the common library was the single source of truth and that's not actually the case. The JSON schemas are defining what they call the common format. So that was confusing to me and Again, I've been at GitLab for a while, so imagine someone that is coming from the outside. Um, that means we don't have a library that user could use to, uh, could integrate or could import to generate reports with GitLab. They have to deal with the JSON schemas and that's it. So that's, that's an okay limitation, but you need to be aware of that and I was absolutely not aware of that. So you're saying that we don't have APIs that allow them to interact with the data in these schemas today that they have to actually just directly manipulate those files, I guess I'm trying to understand. So what I'm trying to say is we have this project here called mm -hmm. the secret report schemas. Mm -hmm. And that is what defines exactly what is the, the expected format for the reports. So you have here everything. So if you want to do something with DAS, for example, it's all defined in there and you have to follow these requirements in order to generate a report that will be passed and integrated into the DB. So there is no API, there is no, when I say API, it's not a, a web endpoint. It's an API from the code, like in Go or Python or, or Node.js. We have something that is close enough called the common format, which is in Go, defining what is a report. So that's exactly what I'm using because that's a great way for me. I just fill in these structures here and I generate a report with that. And I know that report is going to be compliant because the analyzers, most of the analyzers are using this. And it defines, for example, what is the generality in here uh, you need to have a category, you need to have a name, you have to description, you have this CV field and you can see it's deprecated here, the, the famous CV, the infamous CV field that is, is there. So by using that, I can compile what I'm doing so I know that it's going to work, sure. but okay. it's only covering SAS and dependency scanning and I was not aware of that. Even have though you, you have references to Dust in there, you have the Dust mentioned. So I, I believe this is part of why James presented his POC around the generic report schemas. Uh, you know, I, I yeah, we're but not it's, expecting it's not all yet. of it. And, totally. So I guess I'm wondering, given that that POC and you know what is being outlined there, are there still gaps? You know, if we were to be able to move forward with that generic report schema. Does that meet the need that you're describing? Uh, probably yes, but we need to to play a bit with it. Until then, we're going to use the the SAS format, and that's going to be uh, enough for us. So that was it, just for your awareness. Just it would be that you had that in mind. It would be great to get your feedback early on on the generic report schema that has been proposed to make sure that we can try and catch any of those gaps before we implement it, if possible. If there's any fields that aren't being considered or use cases that this wouldn't cover. Uh, yeah, I'll do my best to take a look at that. I need to find And maybe it's not an action yeah, for you, Philippe. I mean, I have to wonder if, you know, some of this, like, I, like you said, you're falling in line with existing report schemas. You're just kind of, you're fitting your square peg into a round pole trying to use existing report schemas. Uh, maybe the individual scanner team would be able to also give that verification. You know, if those are the fields that you need or the, the report fields that you need. Um, they'd be able to help us call out when something's not represented. Yeah, definitely. So I do want your take on this when you if and when you have time, but this also is a good reminder that we should make sure that we get input from the other engineering managers or in developers from the scanner teams. Sure. Uh, let's move on if you would, because we just have a couple of minutes to cover yeah. my second point. So make sure that we at least cover we that. We have the whole is... hour, but you know, we don't need to use oh. it if you don't want to. <laughs> okay, I thought it was just 25 minutes. Okay, let's try to make it quick. And again, Greg, if you have anything, feel free to interrupt me. Otherwise, I will 
speak for you're also Greg you're to... also encouraged to help respond to any of Philippe's uh, ideas or comments you know <laughs> I'm, I'm just kind of absorbing the the knowledge and the questions through osmosis right now but once Story if I do have life, anything man. to add I will definitely chime okay in. sounds good so that, well, that first part could be important for you because I uh, just helped, uh, that was last week, some customers, uh, not directly, to, uh, with the help of some uh, solutions or architects, uh, they, they were dealing with exactly these kind of issues. They were trying to create uh, new analyzers and things to import their vulnerabilities and they went exactly in the same traps as I went uh, to the last weeks. So that's, that means it's not crystal clear for everyone. That's not just me. I was able to help them. So that's the good news. Um, so my next point, there's no question in there, but it's uh, also for our awareness. We're going to start what we call the Security Champions Program. And I'm sorry, I, choose, I should have linked the issue. What's linked to? You linked to the issue itself, and there's a link there to it. Uh, that's a link to the issue that I created, but I wanted right. to Right. At the top of that, there's a link that says Security Champions Program that takes you to the Security Champions issue. Okay, perfect. Oh, maybe it's different. That's not the same one. Let me see that. I was, yeah, that was the link I was looking at right there. That's the link, exactly. Thank yeah. you. Cool. That was the epic I was looking for. And to be honest so with you, I've had that last tab open for almost a week now, wanting to read your conversation with you and Matt. It's a lot of information, so. Yeah, I know. It's bulk of. So I created that <laughs> because that was buried into another issue that was closed. And I don't want everyone to think right. that just because we closed the issue, everything is is done and, and, and fine. And we for transparency, and for transparency, that other issue was the one where uh, the MR widget was displaying the word new, which had always been there, but we had highlighted it by adding colors to the criticality of those. So uh, your issue, what you had, the issue you're referring to is closed simply because we removed the word new, which we all know isn't necessarily solving the problem. It's just trying to yeah. be less misleading. Yeah, we're kind of... Bandings. Putting the dust under the, the carpet with that, but that was, <laughs> that's a very personal opinion. I, and again, I don't think the intention was never to come back to, because we have a lot of other issues around uh, identifying when a vulnerability is new or not, so. Yeah, but I was not sure that everyone had the, the, the good of a view of the problems, at least the, the blocking problems that we we're seeing with, um, oh, I'm still sharing my screen. It's okay. <laughs> I kind of directly open that and go through these blockers. Um, yeah, and then correct me if I'm wrong, Philippe, the, the way I interpreted this issue of blockers that you created, it's a, it's a matter of Matt looking through these or, you know, myself and Tiago and Matt looking through these and identifying that the blockers are either covered in another issue or creating new issues to resolve them. This is sort of a, a catch-all so far? Exactly. Okay. That's exactly that. But that means... There's a lot to do. You have just four points in there. There are probably some more that we can find, but at least these four points are really, really blocking us. For example, the first one, uh, the reports have been written in different points in time. I, I don't want this discussion to turn into, we can change the wording and it's going to be fine. If we tell the users, or oh, your report is outdated, just run a new one. We are going to do that all the time. There is a way to, to do that in a de deterministic way to reproduce exactly what we want. Like if we run the report on the, on the commit today and we branch that commit and we create a merge request, we need to ensure that in any condition, whatever we do, whatever it takes, whatever the time we're spending on the merge request, the report is going to be accurate. And that can't depend on the time between the branching commit and the last commit. Could be six months, we should be able again, in a deterministic way to say, you're introducing something that is going to be problematic. Right now, it's not the case because if you wait too long, the analyzers are going to be updated and you are going to get new results. These new results are going to appear in the merge 
the merge request security widget as new. So that means you are introducing them, which is what is confusing literally everyone. And that's why it's mostly ignored today because we have these false positives showing up in this, in this widget. So that's, that's a problem, but the blocker for us is if we start the security champions program, the, the goal of this program, we're aiming to reduce the number of vulnerabilities that will reach master. The, the whole idea is to ease the, the workload on the app team. So we want to have a way to ensure that we're not making the situation worse than it is by blocking very early these vulnerabilities. That's why we want to have in every single development team, uh, a counterpart of the AppSec team that will be responsible for blocking at the merge request level, everything that could reach master. We have the security approvals in the merge request already, but if we enable them, if we start using them, they will block all the time because of these new findings. Like suddenly we add something in the gymnasium DB, it's something that will show us critical. Boom, all the merge requests today that were uh, created will show you that you have introduced something new because in yesterday it was not detected. And we're going to block the merge because of that. So how the security champion will deal with that, we have no idea. The only way we can deal with that is just say, let's remove the security approvals and we're good to go. So basically ignoring the whole so, widget, which is not dog footing. So your goal is to have these security approvals just based on the new vulnerabilities being introduced. What about the pool of items that are sitting there that have already been merged? That's actually the role of the AppSec team. So you have the developers um, interacting at the merge request level. They will interact with this merge request security widget and the security gates and everything. So for example, this new advisory in the Gendism DB that I'm using as an example, it's going to show up in the dashboard because in, in the pipeline in master, we have at least one pipeline per day. So it's going to show up in the dashboard and we have an AppSec engineer going through the dashboard every day going to all the issues one by one, make sure that they are triage and they are uh, fixed if it's uh, something critical in a timely manner. So th that's why we have this two two step process. But right now we just do the, the second step. We we don't do anything at the merge request level. So actually we are selling to a customer this fifth left story that we are not doing ourselves, which is not great. You know? right. And so if, you if it's not working for us, it's not working for everyone. You want to still retain that part of the process where AppSec triages those vulnerabilities through the dashboard. Absolutely. You just want to be able to recognize when something new is being introduced on top of that and stop it with these, or yeah. choose to stop but it or not, it's, it's with these approvals. Having, yeah. Instead of having 100 critical findings in the dashboard, we could have just 10. That's the whole point because the AppSec team is not stretching uh, as a... As, we're not growing as fast as the, the development team is growing and we have a, a ratio between the number of AppSec engineers and the number of, of developers in the company that is uh, actually not going in the right direction. The trend is, is not great. Uh, we have more and more developers for less and less AppSec engineers. So that means that at some point, we won't be able to deal with all the vulnerabilities that we have in the dashboard. So we need to find ways to make the work of the AppSec team more efficient and really focus on what matters. And that could be avoided, you know, if it's a bit like we're pushing just changes without any unit test because we know that we have a quality team and they will catch up, <laughs> they will catch up everything anyway. So that's fine. But it's a great analogy. Um, you know, some of the items that you have listed here, I know that we've been discussing quite a bit and are very familiar to me. I'm curious about this bottom line around analyzers not returning deterministic results. And really, that should be something that, you know, the scanner teams are focused on and not threat insights, because I don't know how we have any control over that. Yeah, you don't have any control on that. It, it's mostly the analyzers, exactly. 
So I want to make sure that that particular piece of feedback, I mean, I know that you have these conversations with lots of people in Secure, Philippe, um, is that something that's only being reported here or do you have other issues open with the scanner teams that are maybe more specific or that those? No, they are fully aware of that. Already. Okay, good. I just want to make sure. This, this is something that we already experienced in the, in the GitLab dashboard, for example. Without sharing my screen, uh, I can tell you You're that- You're already sharing your screen. Yeah, I know, but I, I'm not <laughs> going to share the, the GitLab okay. dashboard because it's it's a bit confidential, but I can tell you that we have more than 35,000 vulnerabilities reported by DAS as of today. There is absolutely no way right. we are going to deal with that. We're, and there's no way to we're going to ignore them completely. And, and I don't think we want to start like faking it on anyone. You know, we don't want to start to obfuscate anything from the user that's resulting from data from the dashboards, you know, to, to make it look more manageable or anything like that. So, you know, those really need to be addressed at the, the root of the problem. And I just wanted to make sure that this wasn't, you know, with a catch all issue like this, that this wasn't the, the only place that you, and I knew it wasn't, but thanks for confirming. Um, so I know that Matt has already given you a good amount of feedback on these items, Philippe, and I appreciate you sharing them with us in, in greater detail so I understand more. Um, Wayne or Greg, do you guys have any questions or observations about that? I, I do on this one. So with the analyzers not returning deterministic results, um, I found network issues really any any issues anywhere in the stack can affect it but also um like well i'll give an example i i ran an authenticated das scan on a self-managed gitlab instance and i found i kept having to raise the timeout higher and higher and higher and then it would just take forever and I went in and it turns out the problem was I gave it admin credentials and it kept turning on the two-factor authentication requirement. So it would just like DAST would have that and then it would hit the login page and it would try and get in again and then it would hit the login page. And so I had to like manually go in while it was uh, hammering on this self-managed instance and disable oh, yeah. like two-factor authentication requirement um, and there were other things too, where it would, uh, it would just get stuck in a loop in certain scenarios with full scan and um, authentication of any type. It could change something that causes it to get in a loop. Uh, but I also found that the end results were mostly false positives. Like it was, it was a lot of stuff that did not actually seem to represent legit. Uh, vulnerabilities and I did pass that on to Seth and um, I think Cameron and they they put it in a dashboard and nothing came out of it so uh, yeah that's my insight on that that it is a big piece of cake for that you can in there there are two other issues that we're having with um, you, you will probably stumble um, upon that if you use a github instance uh, the first one is we are sometimes generating some objects with a, a random ID. Imagine the to-do list, for example, if you have Dask running on this, it's going to create new to-dos. If the IDs of the to-dos are not one, two, three, four, then it's going to generate a new finding for every new to-do that is not compliant, that is uh, vulnerable to something. That's a new uh, location, so that's a new finding. So every time you run Dask, you have more results in the dashboard. So you're just going to stack up everything. Um, the other problem that we have is, for example, and that's, that's one of the limitations of the, the current DAST implementation. If you have uh, a header problem, for example, there is a, a problem with the CSP header missing or that is invalid in, it's going to be invalid in three, 4,000 pages. It's three, or, or 4,000 different findings for DAST that are going to show up in the dashboard just for one issue because you have one TSP header that is missing and that's in one specific file for, for, for sure. But it's still thousands of findings that are going to show up in the dashboard. And again, there's the way you can delete that apart from asking directly to the to the SREs to run the Redis console and to delete that by hand. 
which is fine for us because deleting vulnerabilities would be a disaster if we open that with an API or with a button. So we prefer to do that, but still it's a bit, uh, that's a bit tedious. So I'm sure that the secure team is going to watch the video of this and take all sorts of good information away from it. But unfortunately, it feels like we've ventured into an area that we don't have a lot of ownership over or control over. So I want to make sure that, um, you know, in the places where we can make improvements, that we're aware of them. Um, so I, I definitely see from this issue that you've linked to here, Philippe, um, that there are some of those items. And I know that, like I said, uh, with the previous item, I will confirm with Matt that we have issues that are tracking them and that I know your con conversation with him will continue on any areas that he's not totally clear on. As far as the difference in point in time goes in the non-producible way, I don't know if we've gotten into that too much. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what your, I know, I know people have talked about like having regularly scheduled scans that keep these up to date. Can you talk more about what your thoughts are here, Philippe? On, how on what handle exactly? Keep how we handle keeping these uh, up to date, like, is it a matter of, I, I guess I just don't know what the action here is. You mean you're still in this issue? Yeah, I'm looking at your issue and I'm looking at your top bullet point. Uh, the reports are generated at different points in time and in a non-producible way. I mean, does this go back to the non-deterministic results uh, just based on the non-producible way? Okay, I see your point. Uh, I would like to remove completely the time from the equation, actually. I think that's something that is not crystal clear to Matt. I need to talk to him about that. I'm yeah, it's not, it's, not even, and... it's not even like muddy clear to me. So. <laughs> In other words, that's, we need to freeze The rules in the analyzers and again that's probably beyond the line of of protect slash slash secure so it's probably on the sure. secure, uh, so secure you're saying that if i if i run a scan last tuesday and then the rules change in the analyzer and i run it again today that now the results are going to be very different and uh, uh it, it creates confusion because of that difference. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if I run the scan again in three weeks, I should have the same results, which is not guaranteed today. Because again, we are we're pulling the, the new organizers all the time with new rules and even SAS could be improved and detect new things. And that will show up in the merge request security widget as new, which is not the case. It's not new. It's just that we are using different uh, rule sets. So one code change should stick with a consistent set of rules until it's merged. You know, you may be making improvements to that rule set, but it shouldn't be applied to uh, a change that's already in progress, is what you're saying. Exactly, exactly. Okay, thank you for explaining that. We, we really don't care about fresh data, fresh rules in the merge request context. We only care about the merge request itself, so about the, the changes that we are going to introduce. But if those rules that are changing on the analyzer are, I mean, if they're improvements and they're picking up things that maybe wouldn't have been caught before, you really want to omit those? Yeah. Why? In the merge request, yes. Because I'm in the context of the merge request. I'm not saying that I'm going to phrase that all the time. We're going to phrase that only if we start branching. Because we don't care in the branch if something arises that is not related to the changes that I'm making. It's going to get caught anyway by the, by the master branch. It's going to be in the dashboard. So the AppSec team is going to deal with that. But in the gotcha. context of a merge request of a, of a branch, I just care. Imagine if I just update the readme file. There's no chance I, cho I should introduce a vulnerability with that. So, Sure. Oh, I, I see. Never now. have anything in the in the vulnerability widget. So there might have been changes that are nowhere, nothing related to what you were doing that will now start to find problems that didn't previously because the analyzers have been updated. Yeah, but never tell that to Olivier. It's going to be pissed off. <laughs> Shh. I think he's here. <laughs> what did I miss? 
Everything. So much, so much. I showed them everything already. <laughs> um, I apologize that I haven't been taking good notes. I feel like it's taking all of my energy right now to comprehend all of this information that Philippe is sharing. My plan was to go back through the recording of this and add some notes to the document. So um, Olivier, if you're interested in my summary of things or my take on things, you can check that later, but we will share the recording of this as well. We just had a one-on-one -on -one with Olivier right before this meeting, so he's aware of, the, aware of all of this. I get the impression that all of that is that you shared today. This is, you, you find yourself sort of repeating the same thing, Philippe. So we appreciate your persistence. I'm a broken record on this. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> persistence is the positive way of approaching that. I won't, I won't give up on that. <laughs> one day, well, now, we'll now it's, officially, say, it's working. You, you have to, it's your job. <laughs> Um, on that note, now that Olivia is here, was there anything else? Oh, Olivia's got an item. You can verbalize as you're typing or yeah. we can wait. It's up to you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to join earlier, but uh, I was uh, focused on something else. And uh, okay. I tried to add this threat management uh, shared calendar, but it's still a pain to try to find. I can it. invite you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, or if you have somewhere, I don't know if you have somewhere the link to the calendar because it looks like we require did you get links? You cannot discover. The, the calendar is named Protect Stage Calendar. I'm just going to do the easy thing and invite you, Olivier. So that's okay. Even with Protect, you can I can do that I for can. me as well. But... Oh, heck yeah. Great. Right. Thanks. Appreciate that. Yeah. There's so many Philippe's here. There we go. And it's not showing in the calendar, by the way. I, I, I have that because I copied the event in my calendar, but it's not showing up in the, the Protect Stage calendar anymore. Well, it's not in the Protect Stage calendar. It's just in the Threat Management sub-department. It might be in the Protect. Did I put it everywhere? Uh, I can add it there if I didn't. I should do that. I should put it in the Protect Stage calendar. I just put it in the Threat Management sub-department calendar, so I'll copy it over. OK. I confused the two calendars. Sorry. That's, yeah, it's easy it. to do. Don't worry. Okay, so in, in the meantime, I will collide what I, I was uh, looking to share here um, because this is really relevant for um, protect and threat management. Mm -hmm. um, so this is an issue I've just starting to share with all the um, secure engineering managers. It's, again, it's a long-term topic being debated uh, multiple times, but uh, I have a feeling that some of the things are like, they're moving slowly. It's like we're leaving people in muddy waters and sometimes some changes happen that kind of change the direction that we headed toward, but it's not clearly defined somewhere. I know we're still struggling to find a good place for technical documentation and some of our guidelines. Our handbooks might not always be up to date, at least in, in secure composition at least. I don't want to stop all the others, but <laughs> at least for me, I, I'm still having some uh, um, backlog on that. So, the main problem we have here is a lot of things that have been sought with regard to our development uh, coding guidelines and architectures with everything touching the security analyzer has been defined at the time we were just one team. And it, was, it kept working this way until now where we are reaching a point where it's panning across um, two stages and two sub-departments. And we are constantly, you have been going, uh, Wayne also try to do, go through that exercise of trying to better delineate uh, the boundaries between uh, the different stages, but even within secure uh, itself, between the different static an uh, analysis teams, it's, it's super hard sometimes. And we constantly find each other to kind of overlap and it, it creates friction and it, it's hard for the engineers to collaborate and be, um, uh, efficient and, and have velocity within our teams. So TLDR is, I would like to revisit that. I would like to make sure we, we have a brand new roadmap to, to go from what we, where we are today to where we want to go, define where we want to go. <laughs> and it seems that what's, what I, from my perspective, I've been always fighting for consistency. And, and this consistency was achieved at the implementation level, bringing as one of its benefits, consistency from the user experience. 
But what really matters to, to most of us, I think, is the consistency from a user experience perspective. And this is achievable without having the consistency being enforced at the implementation level, which opens for more autonomy for each team implementing their own analyzers. And since we are now up to five different teams working on analyzers, it, it really makes less sense to try to enforce consistency in the implementation, in the coding guidelines. And, and, and I agree with that. So I'd like to make sure that we, we are sitting around, the, around our own tables behind our camera and, and discuss that to, to make sure that we all have the same expectation and we clarify that for all the engineers so that we no longer have this difficult discussion every time we're working on, new, uh, on designing a new feature or removing a merge request when obviously we might have different needs. So it's kind of a, hey, container security group is now impacted by that because you are, uh, we have ownership on the container scanning analyzer. And currently there is just one which is clear, but if others are coming in later, you might ask yourself those, those questions. And, and when merge requests happen, the engineer during the review will have to know exactly where is the boundary where they need to look for consistency with the other analyzer and where this given team might have freedom to go his own routes. Does that make sense to you? Sorry, it was a long monologue. <laughs> that was covered. That's the first point, actually, already. <laughs> we already covered that. <laughs> Seriously? Oh, come on, you could have stopped me earlier. I know, that, that was funny. Hear, no, it's good. Hearing things to, to explain in more than one way is helpful for me. So I wasn't about to stop you. All right. So this discussion, Olivier, how much uh, participation should Tiago and I have in it? I uh, assuming, I mean, I don't know how much you're involved into the, this part because it's mostly more back end than front end, but right. you, you will really come. Uh, this is uh, just to clarify, this is really about the analyzers tools and tab that the engine generating the, the reports, uh, the report content. This has nothing to do with all the variety management stuff and how we are trying to unify those different data in, in the UI and the variety management uh, process. This is totally outside of the scope. So I, I'm, other than that, I'm expecting uh, Thiago and his team to participate in that as much as any other engineering manager okay. or engineers been secure. Okay. Just a heads up, we're not part of the uh, at the GitLab.org secure managers group, so I'm glad that uh, you you at mentioned Tiago directly in this. Yeah, I'm sorry. And again, I, I was no, really I mean, thinking it was back end only, so that's why I didn't start about you. But uh, no, no, it's okay. It's and I I think there's similar conversations to be had around front end consistency, and um, you know I, I'll work with Neil on that. Yeah, you did my phase is the same issues for other front end part. I agree. But yeah, um, brace yourself. It's been more than a year that we are facing that we didn't secure and still haven't found a good solution. <laughs> wow, it's been a fast year, huh? Wayne, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, I saw the issue and I haven't looked into it in much detail yet. But I think, I think it's a great question. Uh, I want to see where, since Tiago has been looking into it, I'd like to see where he lands on it, which he hasn't, I don't, he's not seen it yet. But appreciate Olivier bringing it up so we can discuss. Yeah, thanks for the heads up, Olivia. This makes a lot of sense. I mean, the concept makes a lot of sense. I think I need to read the issue several more times to have all the details make sense, though. Right now, the issue doesn't give much proposal. It's just about, hey, Let's start we, need, discussion. we need to address that. I have my own ideas, but I, I, I'd like to let some time for others to come with their own. And, and so that the purpose is just let's do something together and, and, and make sure that we all agree that it's hard to keep going this way. And if, but the, the thing is, we're going from some technical enforcement of that consistency because we are following the same implementation to a, a soft consistency that will need then to be enforced by some guidelines, some uh, specifications or uh, product requirements. But if we maintain this goal to have consistency in the way we're using the feature from a user perspective, that's perfect because this is really what we're looking for because we want this seamless experience, whatever the, the security features you're using, if it's SaaS or container scanning, 
you want them to fit and be of the same way, conf be conf being configured slightly the same way, I'd say, in the UI, and, and manage uh, the rarity being managed the same way um, in the UI too. So. And I'm getting really repetitive in asking this question, but I'm going to ask it one more time. Olivia, you've seen the generic report schema brown bag uh, POC that James Johnson put together? I didn't, unfortunately. I was not there and still haven't caught up with that. Um, I would encourage you. I'm curious how much I, he was trying to solve that same problem with the creation of that generic schema. And I know that it was posed a lot under sort of supporting third party scanners, but I think the same concept applies to our own internal scanners as well about adhering to a very flexible yet well defined schema. I know I've been looking at it mostly from the front end because it really does help with the display of this information, but I'm not sure how much of this overlaps with the, the topic that you're presenting here. It's, it's at, what, uh, at one um, uh, extreme, uh, one boundary of it. The way I'm seeing this issue is that today we've defined boundaries where you have freedom or where you need to be consistent. And the thing is here, we need to shift that uh, to a different location. And the JSON schema is one boundary when it comes to deal with the output. So today, each team has some freedom in the way they are generating the, the data, and, and the consistency is starting at the time they are uh, conforming with the JSON schema. If we go with a generic schema, it might make things easier to do some, change, to do some changes with more autonomy for each team. And then the, the consistency will be moving to the race passer, for example. So each team will be responsible to manage their own schema the way they want and deal with their own passer and make sure that, well, this is well into the reliability management system so that they are responsible for the, com the compliance with that. The other aspect is on the ex uh, opposite side, which is dealing with the input which is currently what we have is the, the common library and the bundle template are defining how uh, the, you are triggering this job or you configure this gotcha. job and how you configure all those tools. Already sure. right now, some of those analyzer have some consistency, some of them don't. So that's why we want to make sure and make clear that this is no longer necessary, how we do that. Thank you. I see the, the much bigger scope now and how I appreciate the further explanation. So we are at time, but to top it off, uh, I do think there is an argument for consistency in terms of support as well. I think that like on the one hand, autonomy, we can ship the improvements to scanners quicker. We can update the rule sets more quickly. We can ship the most recent scanner to our customers. But when it comes down to support, and I'm, I'm doing a like sec, section training module where I go over all the things. One piece that keeps coming up is when you're troubleshooting a scanner problem, you have to check the version of GitLab, the version of GitLab runner, the version of the scanner image when that was released. And sometimes you even have to check the versions of the software inside that scanner. And when inconsistencies occur, uh, like if we have customers running 11.11, .11, if that's pulling latest scanner images and things like that, and there is inconsistency across the group, it does kind of make it more difficult. If, if all the analyzers were to update on a scheduled release schedule or something where it was consistent, it could make troubleshooting a bit easier. But I think uh, for efficiency, just having autonomy is the best. Yeah, that's, that's a very good um, point. And I think what, what you, you need maybe to, to push for in the future is to try to, for example, maintain that level of consistency in the way you can debug or troubleshoot. A good example is whatever the type of analyzer you're dealing with, if you have a problem and you want debug output, you should have just the same variable to configure, not three or four different ones. I think we've did great so far, for, for example, the offline environment, are the, the, the custom uh, bundle certificates, but it was hard. <laughs> but this is where I think it really matters to keep that consistency, whatever the way it's been uh, implemented behind that. Well, we are at the end of our hour. This meeting is scheduled, I think, bi-weekly for now. I'm just confirming that. And we are 
looking to cover both con uh, protect and threat Right, threat insights and container security. So we can reevaluate that cadence and whether it makes sense to have all of the, the two group topics in one office hours. But thank you, Philippe and Greg and Olivier for joining and Wayne, bye Wayne. And um, I will share the record. Was there anything that was shared today, Philippe? You were doing some screen sharing and you were showing um, some dashboard stuff. I wanna make sure that, were you sharing anything that I can't put a video out on? No, 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 it's only mock data, so it's fine. Excellent. Okay, just wanted to make sure. So I'll share this out on uh, Unfiltered, and like I said, I'm gonna try and go back through and add some notes. I'm really struggling to take notes while I listen, especially to fully. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. Have a great thanks, day. Everyone. See you in two weeks, thanks. bye. Bye.